Girl, it's Friday. I don't know why I'm so hyper. I've really got no reason to be hyper. This one's quite a long case actually, so yeah, let's get get our serious hats on. Hi there, my name is Megan. If you're new here and if not, welcome back for episode 12 of Killer Weekend, where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. If you like anything to do with true crime, supernatural or anything spooky, hit that subscribe button. I also have an episode on Wednesday called Weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss horror movies, spooky things, supernatural, UFOs, conspiracy theories and all things in between. So, are you comfy? You in your comfy chair? You got your stand? Just sitting properly, no one's interrupting you. Good, because here we go, and this is a roller coaster ride. So, we're just gonna dive right in. If you're anything like me, you've been wasting your days away watching Netflix, watching Amazon Prime, trying to find something new to watch. And whilst I was digging through Netflix the other week, I found something called White House Farm, and it did ring a bell. And the minute I heard the 999 call at the beginning of the series, I instantly knew exactly what case this was. This is a docu-series which is produced by HBO and it's based around a family massacre that happened in 1985 in rural Essex in the UK. It was a really well-known case in the UK and even though I was born long after this, I actually even heard about it myself growing up and it's a case that I'm really familiar with. Now, I will mention that when I started watching it, it became very obvious that there was quite a heavy bias behind the series and it was obvious that the director had taken information from one side of the camp but I just want to make sure you guys have all the information at your hands and that you're getting the full story essentially. I would still recommend though if you haven't seen White House Farm on Netflix please do watch it after this and to lead into that I guess it's no surprise that tonight we will be discussing the murders at White House Farm. <laughs> Sheila Bamber was born on the 18th of July 1957. She was actually the first adopted child of June and Neville Bamber. The two were upset that they couldn't have any children of their own but they were dedicated members of their local church and they actually managed to adopt Sheila through the church itself. Sheila's adoptive father, Neville, was actually a pilot in the Royal Air Force. He actually broke his back during a plane crash and then chose to go on to agricultural college. So he had an interest in farming and it was through this that he met his wife, June. June Bamber had actually grown up on a farm in Essex. Her family owned an area that is now known for being a popular wedding destination in Essex called Vaulty Manor Farm. So, you know, if you want to have a little look, you know, it's always nice to add a little place to the to the list. If you like that sort of thing, a little bit of creepiness with your wedding venue, on you go. Sheila's adopted mother, June, actually worked as an army secretary during World War II, so she was kept busy with that, but her main goal in life was to be a wife and mother and to have a partner who wanted to work on the farm. She had found that in Neville, but unfortunately the two did really struggle to conceive, and as they'd found their beautiful baby girl through adopting through the church, they actually went on four years later to then adopt their son, Jeremy Bamber. When the children were very young, June became very active in the local church. Some might say a little bit too active but we'll chat about that in a bit. The two were said to have really strict religious views and that they would often make the children pray several times a day like a lot of times a day. In their early teens both children were sent to boarding school and Sheila was actually expelled from one of her schools and then had to join another school nearby and it's not kind of hard to see why because Jeremy Bamber, Sheila's younger brother, actually experienced a lot of bullying. It said that he was completely tormented at boarding school. When the other kids found out that he was adopted it wasn't as common as what it is these days and the kids took that and ran with it. You know it's like kids are absolute assholes so they started calling him names like the bastard and things like that and the orphan even though he wasn't an orphan but Jeremy felt a real disconnect from the other kids and he just felt like he didn't belong. This was a source of resentment for Jeremy. You see Jeremy had found out that his birth mother was actually the daughter of a vicar who had gotten pregnant by an army sergeant and was forced to give Jeremy up at birth. So already he had this underlying kind of hatred for religion and religious figures 
and then he was raised in this family who was overtly religious. He felt like his mother was never quite loving. They said the family home was never a very loving and warm home. Not only that, he was then shipped off to boarding school, only feeling this feeling of abandonment from his birth mother and then his own adopted mother. It just was a vicious cycle that was heading nowhere very good. It was said when the children were home at weekends, June would act not quite right. The children would be made to bathe constantly and not only that they were praying non-stop as well it just seemed a little bit excessive there was no other time for anything apart from eating sleeping and praying to June it did kind of ring alarm bells for other mothers as they felt like she was taking her religious passion a little bit too far upon leaving boarding school at the age of 17 Sheila decided she wanted to follow in her mum's footsteps and join a secretarial college but a spanner was thrown in the works when she met a lovely young artist who was free-spirited, he was adventurous, everything that Sheila couldn't be in her stifling environment and his name was Colin Caffell. She fell instantly in love with him and Colin said that he fell in love with her at the moment he met her and saw her massive eyes and really long legs. You see Sheila Bamber was actually nicknamed Bambi by friends because she had the big massive doe eyes and the really lovely long legs, something that that made her extremely attractive to young Colin. Colin would later describe Sheila as passionate, kind-hearted, very gentle and he also said hungry for love which is just so sad. A lot of her friends also said that she was an extremely talented writer and that she had great skills and she knew how to get a character across on a page. Much to her mother's dismay and anger, Sheila actually fell pregnant at the age of 17 with Colin's baby. Her parents never really approved of Colin. They weren't what she wanted for their young daughter. They hoped she would marry someone who was in the agricultural business or at least had a really good family business behind them. And Colin was just anything but that. And he couldn't provide the life that they believed their young daughter deserved. Her mother was said to be infuriated when she found out that Sheila had fell pregnant out of wedlock. Her family then pushed Sheila into getting an abortion. It was said that she didn't want to get the abortion but she felt like she would be completely cut out by her family if she didn't go ahead with it and they arranged the entire thing. It wasn't too long after this however that Sheila actually fell pregnant again with Colin and this time she sadly miscarried. It was said that she heavily blamed her mother for the miscarriage because she believed that the first abortion was the reason she could not carry the child to full term. Because of the fear that she would receive stigma in the church because of these unplanned pregnancies, June then went on to kind of push Sheila into marrying Colin. Colin and Sheila were very much in love but they were really, really young. They were only very early 20s, late teens and they finally did get married in 1977. The two then went on to have two beautiful twin boys named Daniel and Nicholas. However, this pregnancy wasn't without its issues as well and Sheila ended up in hospital for the last four or five months of her pregnancy because of underlying health issues. Again, Sheila blamed her mother for this because she felt that if she hadn't had the first abortion, she wouldn't have had these problems with her fertility later on in life. Not only that, she and Colin decided to call it a day while she was in hospital as she was starting to cite erratic behaviour and doctors do believe that this was the beginning of her psychosis for schizophrenia starting in her mind. Sheila's family were said to be quite prominent during this time, visiting in a hospital and things like that, but doctors and nurses do remember Sheila acting quite oddly and acting quite strange. She was heavily religious at this time and she felt completely abandoned by Colin. You can see a pattern here. Jeremy himself, he feels completely abandoned by his birth mother, by his adopted mother, by the children who don't even want to talk to him, just call them names. And then you have Sheila, who was abandoned by her birth mother. Then her own mother sends her away to boarding school. She actively gets rejected from a school. She gets expelled. And not only that, now she's feeling the rejection on behalf of Colin. So you can just see there's a domino effect that's happening to these two individuals and they're heading for a course that's not going to end well for them. Once the twins were born, Sheila decided that she could not cope at all. It was quite obvious she was struggling mentally with the two new babies and social services did step in, which is quite rare at the time, but they stepped in and offered a daycare service with foster families in which two foster families would watch the babies throughout the day and then Sheila would do the nights and then sometimes Colin 
Colin and his family would do the nights. Colin was very involved in the boys' childhood. Just because he and Sheila were no longer together didn't mean they weren't still close friends and he did try and stay in Sheila's life as much as he could because Colin said himself that he knew the environment that Sheila was brought up in and he didn't really blame her for the mental problems that she had along the way. At this point in the family's lives, it's not just Sheila who's starting to spiral out of control. Jeremy, Sheila's younger brother, is starting to exude some warning signs as well. You see, he was extremely resentful towards his parents because he felt like Sheila was getting all the attention and was pretty much getting a free ride off the parents. Sheila was given a flat in London to live in while she was trying to cope with her mental issues and she was also allowed the freedom to begin modelling freelance. This is something that Jeremy was never provided with. He was given money to travel Australia and New Zealand after he left boarding school, but it was said that he actually managed to rob a jeweller over there and that he had to get brought home because he was going to get arrested for this robbery. It was also said that whilst he was out there, one of his other friends committed a crime and he was on the run at the time. So definitely red flags starting to show in Jeremy. When he did arrive home he was still feeling the same feelings towards his parents you know his sister had this beautiful flat in London and she wasn't providing any source of income or any help towards the farm whereas Jeremy was working day in day out on the farm he also helped the family run the caravan park that they owned and he felt like he wasn't getting his just desserts for helping the family so much. It was also said that a lot of people had some questions about Jeremy's sexuality. It was said that he would be seen on his father's tractor in the fields wearing full like Lady Antoinette makeup and it was kind of like Adam and the Ants, that kind of prince quaffed way, the little beauty marks. It was very, very of the time, but not for a rural family in Essex. To wear makeup as a man, as a farmer, just wasn't a thing out there. And it was said that he was doing this just to embarrass his father and put shame to the religious family, as many people did question whether he was gay or not at this time. Jeremy did kind of put these rumours to rest when he met a young woman named Julie Mugford. Julie was quite a kind of homely character, complete opposite of what Jeremy was. He was very flamboyant, very out there, very outspoken and opinionated, whereas Julie herself was quite a kind of shrinking violet. She kept herself to herself and she was quite a plain Jane. She seemed like a lovely person to his family, but they didn't really understand where the connection was between them. It did seem like Jeremy wasn't really taking the relationship that seriously. He would often be unfaithful to Julie and he would put her down quite a lot and put her appearance down. Only only to build her back up and compliment her, so he was acting like a typical narcissist in the relationship. In the late 70s, early 1980s, there was a definite disconnect mentally for June as well, Sheila's mum, because she had this daughter who was a model, you know, scantily clad on newspapers. And then not only that, she was a divorcee with two children who were essentially getting brought up by the state. And then you had Jeremy, this flamboyant guy who's putting on, you know, Marie Antoinette makeup to go about in his tractor. And she just could not handle it. This was not the family that she had planned for. And this was not how she had raised her children to be. June had a mental breakdown in 1982 and was actually admitted into a psychiatric facility. It was said around this same time, Jeremy would play the weirdest of tricks on his mum. June had the worst fear of rats and Jeremy would actually collect rats in a little shoe box and then what he would do when June was like in their bed or she was pottering about in the kitchen is he would actually chuck a big box of rats in the room that she was in and then when she would see them scurrying she would have an absolute freak out which is completely understandable that would be like someone opening a box of flies for me so you're a wee shit Jeremy. Unfortunately, it didn't really seem like June's psychiatric treatment had helped her at all. When she got back home to White House Farm, she was even more religious and it became even more of an obsession for her. And her husband Neville just kind of got on with it, sadly. And we will touch on that a little bit and how Neville is involved in things like that. But she was really, really extreme when she came back out of the hospital. So it seemed like whatever it was she got in there, I mean, we're talking about 1982. I don't really know what they were offering up 
up then. Behind closed doors back in London, Sheila herself was suffering immensely. When she had the boys over, it was said that she would exude some of the same behaviours that her mother June did when they were young. She would make the children bathe constantly and they would be constantly praying. She also said to a friend who used to kind of help her out from time to time if she was struggling for money and he said that he would often hear Sheila say things like, there's the devil in the children and we've got to kill the children and I have to get the devil out of my mother and the children. She would say that they were possessed and they wouldn't get into heaven. He never really feared that she would harm the children. He just thought that she was going through one of her episodes. Actually, during one of these episodes, her friend called Jeremy to come and get her and help her because he thought he might know a wee bit more about this. But Jeremy actually arrived on the scene with his girlfriend, Julie, didn't really know what to do, awkwardly laughed at his sister having this psychotic break and left the apartment telling the friend to call his dad or someone else. It was because of this particular incident that Sheila was admitted to St Andrew's private hospital for psychiatric treatment in which she was given an antipsychotic injection which was said to leave her very drowsy, very sleepy, she felt completely numb and she couldn't express any type of emotion. As she wasn't really capable to look after the children in this state, the boys did spend quite a lot of time at Colin Caffell's house, their father, and they spent a lot of time with him and his new girlfriend Heather. They enjoyed their time with Colin but they did often make comments about the fact that their grandmother was quite scary and the house at White House Farm, they were often asked to pray a lot there. Colin wasn't the happiest about that but whenever he mentioned it to June she would just kind of brush it off as if yeah that's fine and then two seconds later she'd have them praying on their knees. Even at one part in the series on Netflix it's actually shown that the kids show Colin pictures of their experience at the farm before they go on holiday there and they've drawn pictures of the gran and she looks all scary and then they've drawn pictures of the house and the house looks evil. Colin actually said on a podcast that he hadn't even seen those drawings until after after the incident so therefore he had no clue what the children were walking into or that they felt that scared about the house. He just thought that their gram was really strict, really religious and they didn't like praying. He didn't actually know how dark things were until he found his young son's drawings showing the house as a monster and showing the gran as a monster as well. The one thing I will say and I know it's a bit controversial but it really it really annoys me and I'm sure he did his best, as best as he could, but it does infuriate me that Neville, her husband, is here for the whole ride. When she's abusing the children with the whole washing 19 times a day and then making them pray morning, noon and night, Neville is there the whole time and then he's watching this cycle be projected onto his grandchildren as well. And it kind of reminded me of the Marlene or Marlene Olive case where her mother was deeply psychotic. She would strip naked and do the most inappropriate things in front of Marlene and her father would just like stand there and allow this to happen and they actually also adopted Marlene and I just think like why would you want to take children who've escaped probably a horrible life in most circumstances and then just bring them into an even worse world. I just don't understand that. The weekend before the White House farm incident, Colin and his partner Heather actually held a housewarming party in which Sheila was invited because they were still quite friendly and he thought it was nice just as an olive branch to invite her over and she could see the boys. It was said that she was very erratic during the party. She was going into rooms and talking to herself. She was crying hysterically and then she'd be laughing hysterically. It was said that she mentioned a few times to Colin that she wasn't happy with the dose of medication that she was on and she was feeling really, really numb to everything and she couldn't enjoy her time with the boys because she didn't know what emotions she was feeling. Also at this party, her brother Jeremy attended with his girlfriend Julie, but Colin said that when Jeremy entered the party, Party, Sheila changed her demeanour really quickly and almost seemed afraid of her own little brother. He was asking Sheila if she had a ride home and if she needed he would ask Jeremy to take her because he hadn't really been drinking and at this point she clammed up and said no can you ask him for me? It's her own brother. So there was clearly something going on in that family dynamic that she was afraid of Jeremy. A few days after the party, Colin would drop Sheila and the boys off at White House Farm for a family vacation. This sadly would be the last time Colin Caffell would ever see his boys alive.
before the horrors of the night began on Tuesday, the 6th of August, 1985. The family were sitting down having a dinner. It was Neville, June, Jeremy, and also his sister, Sheila. And then a cousin of Sheila had came over because she hadn't seen her in ages and just wanted to catch up. The cousin did express that Sheila was completely out of it during the dinner. She wasn't really joining in conversation and she seemed very dazed and confused during the whole thing. At 3.30 a.m in the early hours of Wednesday the 7th of August 1985, Essex Police received a bone chilling phone call from Jeremy Bamber. He was calling from his home shortly down the road from White House Farm, claiming that his father Neville Bamber had contacted him on the phone and said that his sister had gone berserk with a gun. Police went into action and sent two officers to the White House Farm to meet Jeremy at the property. Upon arriving at the scene, the police noticed that Jeremy was nowhere to be seen and it was strange because the police station was much farther away than Jeremy was so Jeremy arrived all out of breath about 10 minutes after the police arrived which did seem quite odd to them as his call seemed really frantic and urgent when they asked Jeremy what had happened, he said that he had just received a phone call from his dad saying that his sister had gone nuts with a gun and the phone had then went dead. He said that he hadn't heard anything else from the family. When he tried to call back, the line was disconnected. When the police arrived, it was said that the lights in the house were on and they were very reluctant to go into the home. Because this was a call about a gun and that someone may have a firearm, they were frightened that someone may still be actively shooting in the house. Now, this is quite infuriating and if you know the case, it will annoy you and you'll never really know why because they never really explain it and it's not as if they were really held accountable for this problem. So essentially what happened was the police, two policemen arrived at 3.30am, stood around, did nothing, whilst Sheila could have been rocking about, shooting everybody and then no armed police arrived on the scene until at least 7am. So you're talking about almost four hours of a gap between police arriving on the scene and then the actual backup arriving on the scene that can get into the house. Jeremy as well during this time was acting a little bit odd in front of officers. He didn't seem too distraught. He was also in no hurry himself to go into the house and if anyone's got nieces and nephews, I do. 100% if someone phoned me and said my sister was going nuts with a gun and I knew my niece and my nephew were in that house, I'd be in that house. And when police arrived at 7am, they stormed the house and they were met with a grisly scene. Neville Bamber, Sheila and Jeremy's father, was found slumped over a kitchen chair dead downstairs. He had been shot eight times, six times in the face and mouth. And then he had also been beaten, which was consistent with the bottom of the gun. Next, police found June Bamber, Sheila and Jeremy's mum. She was actually found in her bed and it appeared that she had been shot while she'd been sleeping. She'd been shot seven times in total. Just next to June's bed, Sheila Bamber actually lay dead on the floor with a rifle placed across her chest and a Bible laid open on the floor right next to her. This yeah, we'll talk about that later. But she was found, she had two gunshot wounds, one at the top of her throat and one just at the base of her chin. It was found that she had the gun pointing up as if that's what she had done and she'd taken her own life. Finally, and probably the worst ones yet, police discovered the deceased bodies of Sheila's two boys, Daniel and Nicholas. The two boys had been shot, apparently in their sleep, in their beds, and they were dead upon police arrival. Upon being told about his whole family being completely massacred. Jeremy was extremely emotional. He was completely distraught and police even saw him trying to make himself sick until he was sick. He was then asked whether he was surprised that Sheila could have done this in questioning and he said no. They asked if he was surprised that Sheila took her own life and he said no, I wish I was surprised. I would have expected her to do that. She was very mentally unstable. And then when they asked was he surprised that she took the life of her two children, he said that he wish she was as well. So this seemed something that maybe the family had been worrying about for quite some time. Well, at least Jeremy had anyway. Right away, the lead detective on this case, DCI Thomas Jones, nicknamed Taff, so we'll just call him Taff for all intents and purposes. He was convinced that this was a case of murder, suicide, cut and dry. Sheila had gone nuts, shot all the family, and then she had shot herself in the neck. And because this was his main theory, no one really wanted to argue with him. 
and a lot of evidence therefore got lost in the shuffle. It was treated like a murder-suicide and a lot of critical evidence was lost. Bear in mind this was an extremely high profile case and Taff and his superiors just wanted this closed. They wanted it done, dusted. They didn't want people around the area. It's quite a wealthy area, a lot of farmers. They didn't want people worrying about this madman who was going into the wealthy people's houses shooting the whole family. So therefore they just wanted something that was easy that they could close and they did feel that with Sheila's mental history she was the only one who could have committed this crime. There were several factors that actually led to this conclusion as well. One being the fact there was no forced entry into the home so they thought the only person who could have committed this crime was someone who was in the home, all the doors were locked, all the windows were closed and locked over so no one would have been able to gain entry to the house and then lock it again from the inside. Also on the scene at this time was a detective named DC Stan Jones. DC Stan Jones was an older policeman and sadly it was seen as a bit of a kind of joke at the station because he was of an older age and he hadn't moved up the ranks at all. He was seen as this kind of nobody and everyone just kind of wanted him out of the way. DCI Taff actually told him to just stay in his lane and deal with the family. He wasn't really to assess the scene. He had already made his mind up that this was a strict murder suicide and he just wanted him to be there to handle family liaison and get this case closed. But he had his thinking cap on that day and there were certain things that Dan Jones couldn't overlook. One of them being the fact that Sheila was shot twice in the neck. Who would kill themselves and have to do it twice. And not only that, who would be able to do it twice? One of those would be almost a fatal shot, so then have to do it again? It just didn't ring true. Also, the placement of the rifle across her chest seemed very posed, and her nails were perfectly manicured on scene as well and it was said that because of the type of gun she would have had to reload the gun twice because of how many shots were fired. Therefore would she have really had perfectly polished nails after having to place ammo into this rifle two times? I don't think so. Another thing that seemed very posed was the open bible next to Sheila as well as if she was reading the bible and then put it down and then shot herself. It just seemed like it was a bit of a setup. Another thing that Stan actually noticed was on the bedside table next to June Bamber's bed was almost like a mark of where the sunlight had, hadn't got to an item and he noticed that missing was a phone, a telephone which had actually been moved downstairs from the Bamber's bedroom. Now this was meant to be the phone that apparently Neville called from to call his son to come help. So why would someone move the phone downstairs away from the family's bedroom? It was heavily suggested that Sheila was not an experienced shooter at all. Jeremy in his interview did kind of hint at the fact that she had been out on several shoots with him and his father but many of the family members disputed this and said that Sheila was not that kind of girl. She would not have got her hands dirty and she certainly wasn't the type to go out on a hunt. She was really gentle and loved animals. That just wasn't her thing. The person who committed this crime was an experienced shooter. Many of the shots were head and chest shots and not only that, Neville Bamber was beaten profusely with the butt of this rifle. Who would have been strong enough to do that? His tiny daughter who was classed as Twiggy, who was super skinny and really really fragile looking. Also, would she have had the wherewithal mentally and physically to do this when she was on a high dose of antipsychotics? I don't know. Another thing that didn't sit right with Stan Jones is the fact that no one ran for help except for Neville. The children were fast asleep in their beds, so was June Bamber. So Neville Bamber was the only one to react to the gunfire throughout the house. It was a rifle that they fired, so it was very loud. He thought that perhaps a silencer had been used. Not only that, Neville Bamber had small burn marks on the back of his shirt, which could have been consistent with a silencer. When Stan relayed these concerns to Taff, he was essentially told to shut up and put up and they were gonna get this case closed. 
Sadly, Colin Cafell hadn't been told yet about his family and when police arrived at his home in London, he was devastated. He wasn't initially shocked to hear about Sheila taking her own life, but he was completely floored to hear about the boys and he just couldn't believe that this was something that Sheila could have done. He said apart from her psychosis, she was a really caring mother and even when she was having an episode, it was never violent. He was always worried about her hurting herself, never her hurting others. Colin then leaned on Jeremy for support as he felt like he was the only person who could understand what he was going through. Jeremy had lost his whole family in the blink of an eye and so had Colin and the two really did create a close bond at this point in the case. Once UK publications got note of this crime, they plastered her name everywhere. Sheila was known as the crazy model who massacred her family. She was known as suicide girl and crazy model. They also referred to her nickname as Bambi as she was known by friends and family and known through her modeling days as Bambi. So they would plaster her name all over the newspaper and make out as if she was this crazed woman who slaughtered everyone in her family. Dan Jones, the DS on this case, soon had his suspicions from the scene confirmed when several family members of the Bambers came forward and said that Jeremy was citing odd behaviour and so was his girlfriend Julie Mugford. Especially when Julie offers to identify the whole family. You see Colin found it too hard to identify his boys. He was still in a state of shock. Jeremy refused to identify his family because he was in a state of shock and the only person who really was willing to do it was one of the Bambers cousins but when they got to the morgue she pulled out and Julie was more more than happy to do it. Julie seemed really emotionless about this and as someone who's never seen a dead body before, I can't imagine going in and then seeing the dead body of two little boys and not having any sort of reaction. When she went in and looked at them, she literally was so dead behind the eyes, she just said, yeah, that's them, and walked right out of the station. This was something that did ring alarm bells in Stan's head because no young woman should react that way at a set of dead bodies, let alone a set of dead bodies of two children. The offer for her to go also seemed a little bit strange because she barely knew the boys. She'd literally met them like once or twice, if you're lucky, at the farm because Sheila wasn't really often there with them. So it did seem quite odd that she was the one that was offering to go and identify them when she'd really never seen them. Policemen on scene at the day of the murder even said that they heard Julie and Jeremy in a bedroom giggling until they went and opened the door. Jeremy then pretended to be sad as if he was crying and then walked out of the room even though officers had heard them laughing minutes before. Now the next part has been heavily discussed online and it's very very controversial so I'll just chat through what happened and then what Jeremy said actually happened because there's two different stories. In the HBO series it's really controversial a part in the program where Jeremy has June Bamber's beloved dog Crispy put down through no reason, no rhyme or reason, merely through the fact that he doesn't want the dog around, that it's irritating him. He invites a vet over to have the dog euthanized in the family shed where he's got the dog tied up and says that the dog's acting super sad without June and that no one will take him for him. The vet then euthanizes the dog and Julie watches on as this happens. However, Jeremy has later came out to say through his legal team that this isn't exactly what happened. He says that the Bambers had two family dogs, one which was a farming dog called Bruce and then the other one which was a little dog which was her mum's best friend called Crispy. He said that another farm took Bruce on but no one was willing to take on Crispy and he didn't get along with the dog. He said the dog was quite aggressive towards him so therefore he decided that the best thing to do would be contact the vet and see if the vet could get anyone to take him on but the vet said that because of the dog's behavioural issues they would have to put it down because they wouldn't recommend it to any families that they knew. This is what Jeremy says. It's not backed up, but we'll never know. Very early on in the investigation, it becomes so clear that Jeremy cannot go on the scene at White House Farm. He refuses to police to go in the house and he says that he can't even go in just to get his mum and dad's belongings into a safe space for storage. He does actually ask police to burn everything in the house with blood on it or any trace of the crime on it and the police actually do this. They actually burn all their shit. So they burn the mattresses, 
is. They burned the carpets with blood on it, any furniture that had blood on it. Essentially, they literally built a pit in the front garden at the home and just burnt all this evidence away. So yeah, there's that. At the time that Jeremy is refusing to go into the home, the cousins of the Bambers decide to take it upon themselves to go into the home and secure their valuables in a storage unit because they're afraid that everyone knows this house is sitting empty. Jeremy's been very vocal about the fact he can't go into the house and he can't face it. So they're worried that the items may be stolen if someone knows that the house is sitting there empty. It's during this search for the valuables that the cousins come across a silencer for the rifle in one of the downstairs cupboards under the stairs. Now, this is highly controversial as well because they happen to stumble upon this silencer with blood on it or a red substance on it which appears to be blood. Now, the police did say that they searched the surrounding area. Was it a very thorough search? Who knows, because they were adamant it was a murder-suicide. So we don't know if that's something that was searched before or after the crime happened. It's never really been confirmed, so maybe it is something they just missed. The cousins then do take this to DS Stan Jones, but by this point, they've all had their hands on it. Everyone's been touching it because no one had CSI at this point, so no one knew you don't touch the evidence. Stan himself even places the silencer in a toilet roll holder with sellotape at either side because he didn't have an evidence baggie on him at the time. Whilst he's there as well, the cousins show him another piece of evidence that they've uncovered. They say that there is a way for someone to gain entry into the house and make it look like no one's ever been there. In the kitchen, there is a latch on the kitchen window, which if you open it and then slam it from outside, the latch will drop down and look as if someone's pulled it from the inside. The thing is, whoever did this, if this was their chosen exit route, they couldn't have entered through this way if the latch was down because if they had tried to pry it open from the outside, the latch would have broken off because it was really, really weak. So therefore, someone's had to have come in through the front door and then leave through this kitchen window. And who would know about that latch in the kitchen apart from someone who maybe lived there? Upon testing, they didn't really have anything like DNA at the time of the murder, so they tested the blood inside the barrel of the silencer and it was found to be that of Sheila Bamber's blood type. So therefore, police then knew the silencer had to be on the gun when Sheila fired the shot into her neck. So either Sheila shot herself twice in the neck with the silencer and the silencer would have still been on the gun when she was found. Alternatively, in a fantasy land, she would have shot herself once in the neck with the silencer on and then taken the silencer off, wandered downstairs bleeding from her neck and hid it in the whole cupboard and then ran back upstairs not dropping a single drop of blood on the way. So they know this isn't a possibility. Police then also figure out that with her height, it would have been impossible for Sheila to shoot herself in the neck with the silencer on with her own hands. Someone would have had to have done it for her. So already, things aren't looking too good for Jeremy Bamber. Stan takes this information to his DCI, Taff, and he completely laughs him out of the room and tells him that they're playing Miss Marple and that they need to get a grip of themselves. He completely laughs him out and says if he does it again, he'll be facing disciplinary action. Stan even then takes this to a more superior officer above Taff and he basically gets his backside kicked for this and this results in him getting a holiday, which is basically basically a suspension. Around the time that all this information is coming to light, Jeremy's behaviour becomes more and more erratic. He's out every night drinking, dancing, eating fancy meals. All of his friends can see that he's not reacting the way a normal brother or son would be. He can be seen even at the funeral of his family crying, like sobbing, breaking his heart. But then next minute in the wake, he's chatting up women and laughing and giggling and doing shots of people. It doesn't seem very consistent with someone who was grieving. And even Colin Caffell's new girlfriend said that she felt like he was celebrating the death of his family and not mourning it at all. 
To add to everyone's suspicions in the family, he then begins selling family heirlooms and possessions, things such as his dad's war medals, his mum's expensive crockery, things that would have been really sentimental to the family. He doesn't really feel any remorse for this and this is something that family members find quite odd. It's as if he's burning through this money super fast so he's got to try and reimburse himself some way. The obsession for the family inheritance as well is very obvious as it was in every sentence that he spoke to Fens. His treatment of Julie during this time as well gets progressively worse. He's cheating on her even more. He's being really really dismissive of her and she's just there along for the ride just trying to get back into his good graces but sadly he's got his hooks in her so deep she's not going anywhere. One of Neville Bamber's secretaries actually said that he confided in her shortly before the murders about a robbery that he believed his son committed on the caravan park. He believed that his son robbed the caravan part but not only that that if he was ever injured in a gun incident that his son would be the one to blame because our relationship was so volatile. Colin Caffell felt that his girlfriend Heather was seeing this side of Jeremy that he wasn't seeing at all. To him Jeremy was this grieving almost brother figure and he and Jeremy had been really really close in the past months since the murders. Heather said that she constantly felt uncomfortable around Jeremy. He was often found dancing and singing and just having a good time. He would act inappropriately with her as well and try and get her to dance and sing as if he was trying to like cheer her up when she had just lost her two almost steps sons. His behaviour was soon to take a terrifying turn when he was found out to be trying to shop photos, nude photos of his own sister, his own dead sister, to the Sun newspaper. The Sun newspaper had approached him when he offered to give them pictures of Bambi Bambers and the paper actually asked him how much he wanted for them. He was asking for about 20, 25 grand and then the papers decided that they weren't going to pay the money and the better story was that this creep was trying to sell pictures of his murdered sister. This made Colin see him in a completely new light because he'd actually been laughing and joking about the nude pictures he'd found of his sister shortly before this. So Colin knew this was true and Colin knew from the description of the photos that the son said he had that these pictures actually did exist because Colin took them himself. They were private pictures taken between Colin and Sheila and he never knew how Jeremy got his hands on them. Jeremy's time as the victim is running thin and even his relationship with Julie is starting to show major cracks. Because his infidelity had gotten so obvious not only to Julie but to everyone around them, she was starting to lose her faith in the relationship and she became very unpredictable. It was said that she would act out violently and scream at him in public and break down and cry when they were out for dinners with people and he just could not have that kind of loose cannon on his arm anymore. Not only this, one of of Jeremy's friends from New Zealand actually arrived in to comfort Jeremy and it was said that the two had a very oddly close relationship. The man apparently was a homosexual himself, he was gay and it was said that he and Jeremy had a very overly friendly type of relationship and that often people thought that they were a gay couple. Julie didn't like this dynamic between the two and it was said that this only fueled her paranoia even further. Fed up with her over emotional antics, Jeremy decided to end the relationship which was probably the worst thing he could have done in his life. Fast forward one month later and who arrives at the police station but Julie Monkford herself and she's got a story to tell. Julie claims that in the lead up to the murders, she and Jeremy started discussing the fact that he was underappreciated by the family and that he had a deep seated resentment for his mother and father and not only that, the preferential treatment he thought his sister was receiving. He often would call her a loony, he would say that she was a nutter and she belonged in the nut house, he said that her kids were overly damaged and that Colin would be better without them all. There was many times that he actually mentioned setting the house on fire but the two joked that it would be so sad because it's such a beautiful house to lose the house. Ha 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 ha, lovely jokes. 
After months of hypothetically talking about killing his family, Julie said that she received a phone call in the middle of the night with Jeremy stating that it was now or never and it was the night of the 6th of August where the whole family would be staying in White House Farm. He said that it was his time, he was going to do what needed to be done and he hung up the phone. A few hours later in the middle of the night at 3.15am, he calls Julie back and states that everything is going well, something's happened at the farm and he's had no sleep that night he's been up all night he then says that he loves Julie and hangs up the phone Julie says at this point she was still half asleep so she didn't even know what he was talking about he had expressed that his sister and the family were coming to stay so she thought maybe something had kicked off with the family and she apparently went back to bed Julie does persist that she didn't know that the killings were Jeremy's doing until weeks later when he finally confessed that he was the one who orchestrated the murders. He said he wasn't the one who committed the crime. He said it was a family friend who had actually went in in the middle of the night and committed the murders for him and that he had paid a fee of £2,000 for it. He said that this man had committed the crimes but he had just been the one to plan it. Julie felt like this was more acceptable for some weird reason and then when police went to solidify that this guy had no alibi this guy this poor guy turned down and said that he was not involved he was highly emotional during the interview and he actually had an ironclad alibi that he was staying with his mistress at the time now i don't really know how it was ironclad staying with your mistress but there must have been something well i would hope that was, you never know in this case because really it was handled with like the worst ever hopefully it is ironclad because if not mm. when the police then returned to julian explained that this man couldn't have committed the murders and with the information that jeremy has provided julie with such as inside information like the latch on the kitchen window julie confirms that that is definitely how Jeremy or the shooter exited the home without seeming like a breaking and entering situation. Also the silencer and that's why no one woke up and the fact that Neville was killed downstairs. There were several things that no one would have known, especially Jeremy couldn't have known that because he refused to even go on the scene once it had happened. When Julie found out that it had been Jeremy that had killed the two boys, she actually did show some sort of emotion as I think she kind of disconnected the crime with him because there was a third party involved. When police asked Julie why he would have done this, why he said that he committed these crimes, Julie said that he had explained to her that he did the kids a favour, that they'd become so messed up with the way Sheila was treating them. It was kind of mimicking how June was with them when they were young and look how me and my sister ended up. So he said that he was doing not only Sheila a favour, putting her out of her misery, that he was also doing the children a favour and then Colin a favour because now he could move on with his girlfriend friend Heather and have normal children. Even though Julie did know insider details to the crime, there was that cloud of mystery over he had hired someone. Why wouldn't he have just admitted to Julie? It's not like he cared what she thought of him. Clearly never. He was cheating on her every five minutes. So why didn't he admit to Julie that he himself was the one that carried out these crimes? Was it to protect himself and give himself some sort of alibi? Who knows? Stan Jones then brings us into DCI TAF and he cannot deny it, he can't hide his head in the sand any longer and he agrees to go into the interview room and speak to Julie himself. Julie's story never wavers, never changes, even under the hard interrogation of DCI TAF. TAF is adamant that he doesn't think that Jeremy has done this and that he believes that Sheila went in, killed the whole family, then shot herself. He doesn't want to hear anything different but he understands that with all this compiling evidence, he has to take it to the other officers. He actually creates a vote with the other officers and all of them vote that they believe that Jeremy's done this. At this point with the evidence police have, they arrest Jeremy for the robbery on the caravan park and interrogate him softly about the murders. They then start asking him questions about where he was on the night, why he didn't arrive on scene quicker than the policeman. Remember, he arrived about 10 minutes after the police and he was literally two seconds down the road. There was other things they asked him like why did he lie about his sister being experienced with guns he said that he was in shock and he doesn't know what he said at that time his whole family had just been massacred he wasn't sure and during this interview there was many inconsistencies within his story he was also acting like an absolute freak so what he started to do and brace yourselves brace yourselves he started to pull a thread out of his jumper snap it off 
and then started flossing his teeth with it while staring at the investigators. Flossing his teeth. And not only that, when he was then left in the room alone and someone was in there to watch him, he would just turn around and stare at the person in the corner of the room and make weird faces and just stare at them. Totally normal behaviour. When police are unable to charge him right then and there due to lack of evidence on the murder of his whole family, he's then released on bail and decides that he wants to go to Saint-Tropez with his New Zealand best friend. He then goes away to Saint Tropez, has a nice holiday, but in that time, it gives police the opportunity to garner more evidence and they are able to finally charge Jeremy with the murder of all five members of his family. He's arrested in Dover upon arriving back from his sunny time in Saint Tropez. Sadly, at this time, Colin can no longer deny that Jeremy is the man who killed his children. He's absolutely devastated. This is the man that he's been leaning on for the last year. He was telling him all of his darkest thoughts about this crime and he's the man who did it. He meets up with Julie eventually who then confirms that Jeremy did commit this crime and planned it for many months. He then asks Julie if she's going to do the right thing and testify against him and Julie does say that she will do this and she'll do right by those boys, which would have been nice a few months before Julie, but okay. Almost a year after the brutal crimes were committed on White House Farm, Jeremy was then tried for the murder of his sister, his mother and father and his two young nephews. He pleaded not guilty and it became kind of a he said, she said case. There was some circumstantial evidence against Jeremy but the bulk of it was very much based on he and Julie's testimonies. The judge even admitted himself. Put all of this other evidence aside, it basically comes down to whether you believe Julie on the stand or whether you believe Jeremy. The main evidence used against Jeremy in the trial was the fact that the silencer could not have been used to shoot Sheila in the throat if she was doing it herself. She could never have done that herself and therefore someone would have had to place the silencer on, unscrewed it after they shot her, put it downstairs and then continued on about their day. Another thing that was extremely damning was his behaviour after the crimes were committed. Several people took the stand to explain that his behaviour was not that of a normal family member, including those cousins who found the silencer. With other evidence that police have been keeping under wraps for the trial, they actually found Jeremy's fingerprints on the Bible that was laid next to his sister's head and then not only that, on the gun that his sister had cradled in her hands. Obviously, he lived in that house for years. Could it have been residual fingerprints? Maybe, I don't know. His mum read that Bible every night. Would his fingerprints still be on it? Probably not. If his sister had been reloading and shooting the gun and things like that, would his fingerprints still have been on it from days before? Who knows? But that was definitely something that almost sealed Jeremy's fate. Another thing that did not help this case was when the defence put Jeremy on the stand. Worst decision ever. Don't put a sociopath on the stand. So Jeremy goes up all emotionless, really cold, and he's getting asked these questions of why he would have done this, why he would have done that, and he just answers so coldly and so callously and just looks at the jury like they're nothing. He's also staring at Julie intensely the entire time she's testifying. Julie looks, I mean, she's a horrible person, granted, but she looks like a terrified victim. She's crying, she's sobbing, she's shaking. Her story is genuine, never changes, and and even under the harsh interrogation of his lawyer, Julie sticks to her guns and doesn't break down. And for someone who's a fragile woman or appears to be, this is really, really strong of her, especially when the love of her life that she was clearly willing to kill for is sitting there right across her. The whole time she looks at Colin Caffell as if she made him a promise to protect his boys in the aftermath and she's going to stick to that. After the two testimonies, it is very cut and dry that Julie's appears more genuine. Weirdly enough though, Jeremy's lawyer even starts to say that Jeremy is a psychopath. He has mental problems and he is psychopathic, but he's not a killer. And I don't know if I think that was the best defence for him. Like maybe just make out as if he's a really nice boy and he was super close to his mum and dad, maybe? In the judge's final statement, he said you either believe Julie 
or you believe Jeremy and the jury were sent off for deliberation. But after several hours, the jury could not come to a unanimous decision and the judge got so fed up with it that he decided that they would do a majority vote, which is super rare in the history of the courts. Like, this doesn't happen. Usually it's either a unanimous vote guilty or it's a mistrial and they're trialed again at a later date. This is something that really doesn't happen that often or at all and especially in the UK judicial system. So this shocked quite a lot of people but eventually the jury came back with a vote of 10 to 2 that Jeremy Bamber was guilty of the murder of his sister, both his parents and both of his little nephews as well. The judge then sentenced Jeremy to five life sentences with a recommendation that he would not be optional for parole for at least 25 years. Jeremy has tried to appeal his conviction several times since he was convicted in 1986 and we're now looking at 2021 and he's still going so you know I don't doubt for a minute that he still will try and overturn this conviction. He's been in jail for almost, is it 40 years? Yeah, so 2026 will be 40 years. Over the years, Jeremy has stated with his lawyers that vital evidence was withheld not only from his initial trial, but from his recent appeals that have been rejected. He claims, now we need to take this with a pinch of salt, but I think it's worth mentioning because they kind of hint at this. Sorry, I've got hair in my mouth, Jesus. So they kind of hint at this in the HBO series at the beginning and then brush right past it as if it never happened. And I don't know if legally they had to put it in, or they just decided to put it in as kind of a red herring. So when the two police officers who were not armed arrived on scene to meet Jeremy at White House Farm, they did note that they thought with the lights on upstairs, they saw someone passing the window. And this is something that's mentioned at the very beginning of the series and then it's just never mentioned again. However, now the police officers state that it was their own reflection in a window, but it was an upstairs window and they were far away from the farmhouse when this happened. They didn't get right up to the windows. So it's just one of those things that did they see someone in the window? If that's the case, the police arrived on the scene around 3.45, 4 a.m. So that would put the time of death at when Jeremy Bamber was literally standing right next to them. Sheila must have shot herself if she was still wandering around with a gun. He also claims that he himself was not the only one to call the local police station that night. He says that his dad, Neville Bamber, called the local police station to claim that his sister was going on a rampage with a gun. Please still to this day do deny this however transcripts were released and a young girl who was a dispatcher said that this call did take place shortly after this the transcripts were allegedly lost and this claim has been completely denied by the local police station the next kind of bit i do kind of agree i mean he's a very intelligent young man jeremy you know when you see him speak and things like that yes he's a monster he's definitely a sociopath or a psychopath whatever one he gives you ted bundy vibes it's really weird but he is very intelligent so he clearly isn't daft but he claims that why if he was the one who committed this crime why would he put the silencer in the cupboard after shooting his sister with the silencer he thinks that police would have obviously taken one look at the scene and given it a fine sweep so why would there be a silencer in the cupboard down the stairs the only thing i can possibly think of for that reasoning if it's not on his kind of side is that perhaps the silencer was then planted days after the murder took place such as he had it on his possession but then when they started looking into him and interviewing him a little bit more he was maybe worried they were going to find it on his property and therefore he put it back in the house thinking no one would really know if the silencer was used or not. One of the pieces of vital evidence that he says exists is something you can't really argue with. So it does make me wonder, this is the only thing that makes me suspicious if maybe he didn't do it. And I really don't want to believe that he didn't do it because I don't want to believe that he's sitting behind bars for the murder of children because he must be having it rough in prison. So if he didn't do it, then that's really sad. But in one of the crime scene photos taken of the bodies, it's shown that Sheila's wounds were still pouring and still wet 
sorry, at the time the photo was taken, which would place her time of death at between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. when he was at that time drawing maps out of the home for police to get in and get the best access point. So therefore he couldn't have been the one to do it if she'd killed herself between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. A pathologist has confirmed this who works for his team but you can pay anyone to say anything. Sadly, a big bulk of evidence was misplaced by the Essex police and this has never been recovered. There's definitely other avenues of thought for this. Sheila's own therapist said that in her sessions, she said she was terrified that she would murder her children because they had the devil in them. So even Sheila herself at the time before the murders felt like she was a danger to her own children. Not only that, the young cousin who found all of this evidence certainly had something to gain by finding this. She would have known about the latch on the window because she grew up there. She said the Bambers were like her second family. So she would have known the latch that opens and closes on the outside of the home. Not only that, she found the silencer in the downstairs cupboard just looking for valuables to put away in a storage unit. And since then she has inherited quite a lot of the property. So that could be a motive. The original detective DCI Taff still to the day he died believed that Jeremy Bamber was innocent and that his sister Sheila Bambi Bamber was the one that slaughtered her entire family. However, he actually passed away in a tragic accident at his home. He fell off a ladder just weeks before the trial was due to go to court. My thoughts on this they change. I'm not going to lie, they change, they vary. Do I think Jeremy Bamber did this? 100%. Yes, a thousand percent, I think he did it. Do I think that they had enough evidence to convict? No, I don't. And do I think he was given a fair trial? No, I don't. I think they had Julie's testimony. She was a scorned ex-girlfriend. He literally dumped her four weeks before and she was clearly involved in this crime and never really felt any remorse until he broke up with her, which is convenient. So I do think that things were mishandled. I think in a normal court of law today, her testimony would be completely thrown out because she's not a reliable witness. Not only that, the items that they said had his fingerprints on them were items that were either his or he had used in the past, such as the gun. He had handled the gun and he was cleaning the guns and everything like that the day before, allegedly. So this is something that he borrowed from his dad quite often for hunting. And he also said that there was certain animals pestering the wildlife around there and he would often go and sort them out. These were things that he would have also had a handle on in everyday life like the gun, they were a hunting family. Um, the one thing I do think is a bit fishy is the Bible. I think the Bible's a bit fishy because it said that June had that Bible 24-7. So I don't really get how his fingerprints would get on her Bible if she handled it so much every day. But I'm not a fingerprint expert. I don't know. I do feel like the silencer was probably the nail in his coffin. But I also believe that if they did not have Julie's testimony, he probably would have gotten away with it. I don't quite know whether I believe him about the extra evidence that has since come to light that no one knows about. I'm not too sure. I think it's important to mention it. The one thing I do believe is that police officers on the scene believe they saw someone in that top window that night because it's mentioned in the HBO series so it must have been something that several people noted at the time. I believe that they possibly seen someone in the window. Could it have been Sheila? Who knows? Could it have been someone else who carried out the crime for Jeremy. I feel like so much is left out from the HBO documentary, such as the family's background. It's all a haze of kind of religious abuse. You don't really know the background or where the kids came from and the abandonment that Jeremy felt growing up and Sheila too. Sadly, do I think June put these children on a collision course for evil? 100%. Do I think either of these children acted on impulse alone? No. I think they were led down a path that led them to this. The only thing I cannot resonate with is the fact that the two children were murdered in this crime. It's unforgivable.
The sad thing about this case as well is that Stan Jones, the DS who solved the case essentially, was never given any sort of commendation for writing this wrong because the family were actually cremated and everything because they believed so much that this was murder suicide. Shortly after the case was closed, Julie Mugford went on to sell her story to News of the World for £25,000, which was a big chunk of change back in 1986. A lot of people have questioned her motives for this and said that she was just a gold digger and had Jeremy never split up with her or began cheating on her, she would have probably stuck with him and no one would have ever found out that this happened. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that this was a case of mistaken identity and an innocent man is sitting in jail? Do you think Sheila committed the murders or Jeremy was this cold-hearted evil man who just wanted his family's estate? Or unpopular opinion do you believe it was one of the cousins that did it to get the family inheritance and then frame jeremy for this crime it's a possibility you never quite know in true crime I think it's one of the saddest cases just because the death of the two boys got completely overlooked because of the sensationalised of Bambi, this model who killed her family, this crazy model. And then not only that, when the tables were turned and it was Jeremy, he was known as this party playboy, stuck up rich boy from a good family. It just really never touched on the fact that two young lives were cut so short and that's a real tragedy here. I hope you guys like this week's video. I hope you feel that you've got all the information now regarding the White House farm. If you like this video, please hit subscribe. I will be back again on Wednesday with another weirdo Wednesday and we'll have something about a ghostly bride. So something a wee bit different. And then you'll see me on Fridays for True Crime Fridays at Killer Weekend. Hit that notification bell just so you don't miss me because I'd find you. And finally, give that thumbs up button just for good luck. After today, if you want any more spooky content, please feel free to follow me on Instagram at Megan True Crime and also over on TikTok at Megan.TrueCrime. Remember guys, lock your doors, don't talk to strangers and don't sell naked pictures of your sister to the newspaper. See ya!